of school shootings. They have been a part of society for as long as I can remember, and we need that to end. The Columbine shooting occurred less than a year before my birth. Columbine lost 15 lives that day. In 2007, there was a massacre at Virginia Tech. 32 people died, 5 faculty members, and 27 students. At Sandy Hook Elementary, we lost 20 first graders and 6 adults. 20 first graders. First grade is about learning the alphabet. First grade is about construction paper and recess and snack time. It should never, ever be about survival. After Sandy Hook, we thought the shootings would end. We thought they had to. Sandy Hook was so horrific, so tragic, so unbelievably terrible that we could not conceive of it as just another shooting. It had to be the end. We had to have reached the bottom. But it was not the end, and the school shootings have not stopped. Since Sandy Hook, 400 people have been shot in over 200 school shootings. The list goes on and on. We let these tragedies fade away, forgetting, or more realistically, trying not to think about the horrors experienced and the lives lost. It's too disturbing to think about and too disruptive. The emotional and physical pain are unimaginable, so we try not to think about them too much. It's too hard. My generation did not choose this. Our teachers did not choose this. We do not want to attend school every day in fear. Our parents do not deserve to worry until they know we are safely home every day. There are websites dedicated to teaching parents how to prepare their children for school shootings. A sixth grader in Alabama came home from school one day with a will for his family in case a school shooting occurred. It contained a list of who would receive what in the case of his death and a goodbye letter to his family. Why? Why are we focused on preparing for this to happen as if we have no choice in the matter, as if it is inevitable? We need to focus on preventing school shootings. A month ago today, on February 14, 2018, a shooter entered Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School and began pulling the trigger. He left after taking 17 lives. 17 people died. 17 families were shattered and hollowed out, oh no, in a hail of gunfire. It could have been us. So sorry. It could have been Elyria High School on the news that day. It could have been your school. Do not let the Stoneman Douglas victims become a statistic or just another sad story we see on the news. 17 people lost their lives that day. The students killed will never go to college, never hug a close friend, never have a family of their own. The adults killed that day will never see their children in spouses again, never share another moment with their loved ones. We now will name each of the Stoneman Douglas High School victims and share a fact about each person. This will be followed by 17 seconds of silence. Alyssa Aldhef, 14 years old, a soccer player. Scott Beagle, 35 year old geography teacher and cross country coach. Martin DeQuay, 14 year old football fan and born in Mexico. Nicholas DeWart, 17 year old, attending University of Indianapolis for swimming. Aaron Feist, 37-year-old football coach. Jamie Gutenberg, 14-year-old dancer. Chris Hickson, 49, athletic director, veteran, and wrestling coach. Luke Hoyer, 15 years old, basketball player. Kara Loughran, 14-year-old beach lover and dancer. Gina Montalto, 14 years old, a soccer player in the color guard and a Girl Scout. Joaquin Oliver, also known as Guat, a 17-year-old, born in Venezuela and loves soccer. Elena Petty, 14 years old, in the JROTC. Meadow Pollock, 18 years old, attending Lynn University. Helena Ramsey, 17 years old, served in a United Nations club. Alex Schachter, 14 years old, in the marching band. Carmen Shentrup, 16 years old, National Merit Scholarship scholar final, semifinalist. And Peter Wang, 15 years old, Darrow TC, awarded with a medal of heroism from the Army. Oh. And now we will take 17 seconds of silence to honor each of these victims.
people deserve to live, and we failed them. These are real people. They had lives, thoughts, families, and friends. They probably stressed over a math test or fought with their siblings just like you and me. Children should not die in a supposedly safe space, and teachers should not have to choose between themselves and their students. We can't allow families to wait for the call that will never come. We can't allow these deaths to continue. This is not a political issue, not right versus left, not blue versus red. This is an issue of unsafe education. This is an issue of those who remain silent about these victims' deaths. This is an issue of everyday fear. This is an issue of living and of dying. We must make a change. We attend one of the biggest and most diverse schools around, and there is one thing we should never have to worry about, our safety. We deserve to sit in class and pursue our education without risking our lives. We deserve to know that the tragic things happening to other students and teachers around the country will happen again. There is one thing, there should never be a time where we have to walk in school scared for our lives because our political leaders aren't doing their jobs. It is time for students and teachers to set an example for our Congress and politicians who are blind to see the tragedy happening around us. So today we stand together and as one, we demand change. We will fight for our safety until we get what we deserve. Fear has no place in Elyria High School. Today is the start of our journey to ensure that the current and future pioneers can learn in a safe environment and live in an even safer community. As a child, I grew up naive like so many of you. I thought police caught all the bad guys and everyone knew who the bad guys were. It never really occurred to me that the bad guys could be anyone. We pass them on the streets and we sit next to them in class. They are inevitably everywhere. Today, we speak out. We speak out to remember the victims of Parkland and every other life ended too soon. We speak out as the kids who have grown up with shootings being normal. We are the kids who now stand united with kids across our country the greatest country in the world where mass shootings are normal. It's time we stood up. This country is our future. We are the future. Changing the world is never impossible, but it takes an incredible amount of effort. We can contribute to the movements already gaining momentum. By coming together, we can do so much. Just by being here today, we are showing a strong support system, not only to Parkland, but to Sandy Hook, Chardon, Columbine, and the shootings that did not happen in schools. We stand with the victims of Aurora, Charleston, and Las Vegas. When we are told our voices won't change anything, we stand up taller and we speak louder. They say no, we say yes. We live in a society where we wonder, who's next? A school, a church, a concert? Will it be closer to home, someone I know, or me? Today's purpose is not to protest or resist. Yes, if it comes to that, we can and we will. If it comes to that, you will find me in the front. But today's purpose is to start the fire. It is to catch attention and say, hey, we will no longer be pushed aside. You have a voice. Your voice matters. Your voice can change the world. And I encourage you to join us as we say, enough is enough. Things need to change. I can't say exactly what needs to change, but things simply cannot stay the same. So get involved. Join us. Find your voice and use it. We are students, we are victims, and we are change. The problem is that there are people that want to kill other people. And there are people who have reached a point where they no longer feel like they have anything left to lose, and the only option left that makes sense to them is violence. How does a person get to this point? What is their life like? Take a moment and consider yourself in the shoes of another. When you see people angry, confused, and expressing violent behavior, consider what they could be going through. Consider that their problems might not be similar to yours. Consider that their lives may be stripped of what happiness you would typically expect from any other. These people have no one to turn to. They could feel attacked from all angles, maybe at home, maybe at school, and there isn't another easy way for them to get out. It's their final straw, and they've gotten to a point where maybe they just don't care if they're dead or alive, but they want their pain to be shared. It doesn't have to get to this point, and there are ways for you to help. It shows empathy. Reach out to your peers, to your children, to your students. If you see someone suffering alone, take time to talk to them. It might not always be the easy thing to do, but that doesn't mean it's not right. 
you're not comfortable reaching out personally, you could talk to a teacher, a counselor, or an authority. And if you are an authority made aware of a peer's suffering, I urge you, please treat them as a priority and please treat them with care. The behavior itself is not something that needs to be punished. It does not need to be something that they are made to cope with or shoved to the side. It needs to be helped. It should be cared about, listened to, and given the opportunity to thrive. These shootings can be preventable. Let's start making it so today. We're now going to have a song sung by the choir in memorial of the victim of the Thank you for being here today. You may all head back to class now.